Good morning, Second Service. Wake me up. That's good. That's good. All right. Good to see everybody. We're in a series called Change of Heart. That means to change your mind, change your opinion, change your stance, change your attitude about something is what that means. Um, and so we've, we started that last week, the second week. Uh, first service had a lot to say about the, the message today. That there were some conversations about it today. I think you can leave here different. If you came expecting change and asking God to change some areas of your life, I know that he will. And so uh, it's been a real busy season. I know a lot of people are, are sick. I went through Food Line yesterday and all the, the um, 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 sick uh, medicine was gone. I mean, there was nothing to get. And so I thought, man, there must be a lot of... People sick, but you're here, and so I'm so thankful for that. So I've been spending a lot of time lately watching football. I mean, it's just college football season. That's what I like. It's my guilty pleasure, and I can watch any team. I just really enjoy it. And, man, I'm not a bet man because I lose every single time, Uh, but I love it because I love to root for the underdog. I love to pull for the person that's supposed to lose or the team that's not, not supposed to be good enough to win. And, man, I love that. And there's always a spiritual uh, perspective to gain from that. And I want to press down on that today, man, because when we look at Scripture, person after person in the Bible embodies this mentality, man, that when our circumstances are overwhelming, that the, that the least likely gets chosen by God. And it's over, that pattern is over and over again uh, to do his work to build his kingdom and to get his message out. So the good news is he still uses people who are overwhelmed and underqualified. I think you're going to leave here encouraged today. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking about um, uh, insecurity today because I believe there's this, this, it's either one or the other, it seems. Sometimes the reason people don't do God's work, they don't step into his will, they don't uh, accept the assignment from God, is sometimes it's spiritual laziness. It just is. You know, I just don't want to be inconvenienced by God. I just don't want that for my life. But I'm, I'm figuring out that most of the time, it, it's the root cause of it is insecurity. And so we want to wrestle that to the ground today. As a matter of fact, um, with insecurity, in, in the New Testament, Paul was challenging the church here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 26. And he's talking about grace. And he says this. He says, brothers and sisters, those who have come into a relationship with God have decided to follow Jesus It says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. And not many were of noble birth. What he's saying is here, look around. We're not an impressive bunch. There's not a lot that we've got going on. As a matter of fact, some of us are maybe be considered some losers. We've got some some flaws. We've got some issues. We're not the cream of the crop. But we're still called and the good news is that God's still in the business of bringing victory to our life even when that's our circumstance right so we're going to focus on this one person in the Bible that kind of highlights this principle I think that uh we've spent a lot of time on Moses over the years uh, but today I want to talk about Moses everybody say Moses all right Moses was an insecure guy and admit it or not that I believe that we if we're all honest that that we don't confess this publicly, but if we look deeply enough, a lot of times that's our issue as well. So I want you to write this down just to get yourself started, uh, just to, so you're always in the habit of taking notes and seeing and, and pointing to Scripture with it. Watch this. The biggest enemy of our future and God's purpose to our life is insecurity. It's insecurity. It's really in the way. It shuts people down. It stops them cold in their walk with Christ, especially when God's called us to do big and great things for him, right? And at our core, we start to doubt ourselves. It's our automatic thought. It's where our thoughts veer to automatically is that we're maybe not good enough that we're... And, and, and Moses was exactly like that. So I love that the Bible shows us the warts and, and parts of people that uh, most people don't want to show. But the Bible does this for us and it's to move us forward. And Moses had a, a lot of legitimate reasons to maybe feel that way. He, he was faced with adversity since the day he was born. I mean, right off the bat, they were killing babies. He was on target to, to die. That they were, uh, and his biological mom thought it was a really good idea to save his life, to build a little tiny boat and put him in the river because she didn't have many options because all the babies were, were being killed. So from the very beginning, Moses had all kind of adversity in through his life. And you don't even have to be a Bible scholar to know the story of Moses. You can watch a Disney movie about Moses, and it it points to his life. Um, But as the story goes, Pharaoh's daughter 
came and pulled him out of the water. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And she was adopted by the Pharaoh and the, the, the emperor's daughter. And, and instantly, right then, he was considered royalty. royalty. So, uh, which seems really cool. But the whole time he grew up, he knew he was different. There was something about himself that was just different. Maybe it was the way he looked. Maybe it's the way his facial features were. Maybe it was his skin tone. And I don't know at what point in our life that we realize that we're different. That there's something different about us. Maybe it's our background. Maybe it's the way we look. Maybe it's the way we talk. Or maybe it's something that happened to us. But at some point we start to realize that we are different. But, but Moses realized he was different. And, and maybe it, it's anger or bitterness. But it also um, kind of produced this um, sense of justice for him. And this desire to be to, to see different people uh, that were oppressed get them liberated. He started having a heart for a certain population, right? And he had this passion to set the people of Israel. He perceived them to be free. And these people were slaves in Egypt at, at the time. But he had this passion that, man, this is just isn't right. Something should change here. Something should be different. And one day, he sees this fight going on. And this Egyptian was beating down the, one of these slaves. And his insecurity started to, to boil up. And, his, and, and, and if, because of his passion for justice, it turns out he killed the guy. He committed murder. And this is a real turning point in, in Moses' life because he had to leave Egypt. And he had this... Great place, this great life lined up. He was meant for a lot, and he was royalty, and he had the best education money could buy. He had a future that was just within reach, but he had to leave and run away. And so he runs away. That's the short uh, version of the story, and he finds this guy, and this guy had a daughter, and he sees this girl, and she is so cute, son. She is fine. He decided he had to marry her, and he did. And he settles down, and he has some kids with her, and he works for his father-in-law. And he spends the next 40 years. Everybody say 40 years. That's, that's going to be important. 40 years of his life working for his father-in-law. Now, there's nothing wrong with that life. That sounds pretty good. But this guy was different. I mean, he was formerly the prince of Egypt. And now he's working for his father-in-law. And he's shepherding sheep in the middle of a desert for 40 years. And, and his, his life seems at this point kind of completely wasted. Like it's off track. Right? Something just doesn't seem right about it. But one day... He's doing his thing in the desert, and he's shepherding his sheep, and he encounters God. It's a familiar story in the Bible. It's called the burning, about the burning bush. It's in the book of Exodus, if you want to go back and, and read it. And Exodus 3 is where we'll be starting from today. And I want to show you the cause of insecurity. The cause. Like, man, God's called me to something. I feel it. I feel him moving in my life and uh, moving forward. And something, the the the... All of a sudden, you start applying the brakes. It's because insecurity has slipped in. And I want to show the cause of that, but not just the cause, but how we overcome that. And so, because I'm convinced the biggest reason that, that God's people don't do God's work, and, and, and when they're supposed to, it's because, and, and be the presence of God on the, and tangible love on this earth, is because of insecurity. And we start thinking, man, I'm not good enough to do what God's called me to do. So in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, this is God speaking to Moses from the burning bush. And this is how it goes. It says, Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've seen this. And I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering." So in one swoop, Moses meets God and, and he has this encounter and it's the voice of God. And God says, I am God, which is a pretty big deal. And not only that, but God seems to share the same passion that Moses does about the injustice that's happened to the people. And God says, I see what's going on and I don't like it. And Moses said, see, God, I agree with you. I tried to do something about it, but it got me in trouble. And then he starts saying, God, I definitely think you should do something about that. Which is a day, I don't know if you've ever told God what he should do something about something. You know, it's pretty bold to say that. And sometimes that's dangerous. I'm going to show you why it's kind of dangerous. Look at uh, Exodus 3 verse 10. And this is God's response. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You're right, it is a problem. 
And I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Bring them out of bondage. Bring them out of slavery. I'm using you as a part of that. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. This mountain right here where I'm talking with you right now. You're going to see you, these people are going to come back and worship at this mountain. So it's dangerous to say to God, God, would you do something about something? And um, something's not right in the world. I see an injustice. I see a need in people. Because he'll call you to do it. That's part of him providing the solution. And he'll often follow up with, you're my guy. You're my gal. So I am. I'm going to use you. So we're talking about insecurity and what really keeps us from embracing God's assignment. Right? From God to the world. Let's pray real quick. Father, thanks God for just bringing us together. God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you change us with it. God, give us a change of heart. Help us to see things the way that you see them. God, we're asking us, we're asking you to change us today, that we would leave differently, Lord, that we would have to be more confident and bold in the assignment that you've given us, God. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. That's good. So embracing the mission of God starts out with a revelation of, of who God is. And he says, I am God. And later on when Moses says, what's your name? He says, I am who I am. So he, he, that's his name is I am. And so this becomes kind of the personal name of God. Everybody say Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh it's on your screen. Yahweh, which is the Hebrew way of having an uns- being able to say an unpronounceable name. I am God. All right. And so he, what he says is, you're going to go for me, and I'm, I'm, uh, I see what's going on, and my solution to that problem is you. And again, when we pray for God to do some stuff, you know, some, to make some changes, that he uses us. And here's what, here's what Moses asked. Here's what he asked. He says, well, God, who am I? He starts out with, who am I? And if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you three causes for that insecurity, and here's the first one. Insecurity comes from focusing on who you are instead of who God is. I'll say it again. Insecurity, the way it starts, is it comes from focusing on who you are instead of who God is. Because God says, I am God. I've got this. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk you through every step. That's an amazing promise from God. But Moses says, yeah, but, 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 but who am I? I hear that about you, God, but who am I? And oftentimes we slip into insecurity and feeling not good enough when we start to do that. And what Moses is saying is, you know, I'm not good enough, God. I'm not qualified. I've got a past, God. If you hadn't noticed, I murdered a guy. And I've been wasting, God, I feel like I've been wasting 40 years working for my father-in-law out in the desert. So who am I to do something so big and significant that you've called me to do? And God says... It doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am and that I'm with you. And so so many times in church, we we, we never really get this. We think we get it. We act like we get it. But we never really get the fact it doesn't matter who we are and where we've been and what we've done or how poor our resume is. Right? We never really get that. But the story is going to show us this, that my mess has the potential to be God's miracle. We have a hard time buying that. We really disqualify ourselves. It's never God to begin with. It's always us disqualifying ourselves or allowing others to decide if we're qualified or called. But it, I want you to write that down. My mess, the things I've, the decisions I've made, the situation that got me into, whether it was my fault or the fault of others, God's got a potential to use that and to, and to be God's miracle. As a matter of fact, if Moses had applied for a job, as soon as he mentioned, I murdered somebody, he's gone, right? That doesn't look good on a, re- a resume. You don't even get an interview at that point, right? But God's saying, listen, man, this isn't about who you are. It's about who I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose you and use you. That's what's going to happen here. I didn't choose you because you're right for the job. I'm, I'm calling you because you're, I'm not calling you because you're qualified. I'm qualifying you because I called you. I will make a way with that. But all Moses could focus on, focus on is what he had done and where he had been and what his past looked like instead of focusing on God. And how many times do we do that? He, by God saying, I am, that should settle the deal. It really should. But 
Did you ever know these guys in school, I started thinking, where um, there's a little guy, his name was Ronnie. I say little guy because he was little. He was scrawny, all the words uh, that would match that. His name was Ronnie. And if you're on Facebook, Ronnie, what's up? Um, And uh, it's been years, I mean decades and decades ago. But Ronnie was small, but he had the biggest mouth. And he always talked junk. And he was bold and cocky. I'm like, how can you be that little? And bold and cocky and, 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 and say anything you want to say. And the reason was he had his big cousin that was always near him. And his, although Ronnie was small and he, what he lacked in height, his, his cousin made up for it. So he could basically walk into a room and talk to anybody any way he wanted to. He had this confidence, but it was because of who was with him. And I feel like, man, that's the same way that God works is when God says, I'm with you. I'm calling you. I want it to be a church full of people that accept their assignment for God. All right, that they use this as a launching pad for it, that they use our church as a, as a way to accomplish what God has called us collectively to do and you to individually do, me to equip you to do that, All right? But I, you got to have that confidence. Insecurity wants to threaten to, to creep in and take and rob you from that, All right? We have this perspective uh, from the things that's happened to us in life and our patterns of thinking. But God wants to have us a change of heart. And man, when he says, I'm with you, man, that should automatically, we have to remind ourselves over and over by reading his word, say, man, God is serious about being with me. And therefore, I can talk, man, I can go and do what he's called me to do with confidence because he's with me. Amen? All right. Some of you don't believe that, but that's what the Bible says. So he had this confidence that he's offering, man, I'm with you. I want that to give you confidence. But Moses For Moses, embracing that seems almost impossible for him. And God says, look, I'm going to show you that it's really me. And this is going to be the sign. When I'm done, when this is all said and done, you go do your assignment. When I'm done, you're going to lead all these people, literally millions of people. You're going to bring them back to this very same mountain right now where you are, where you're feeling insecure. You don't see the end of it now, but you're going to bring them back here. And you're millions of people, and they're going to worship me at this mountain. It's like God saying, you know, you feel like your past has disqualified you. And, and from what I've called you to do, you may feel like, man, you've wasted a season in your life. That you can't be used anymore. But, but life's going to come back full circle. It's come back to this very mountain. So the Bible says he worked for his final law for 40 years. Say 40 years one more time. You'll say it again. All right. And all he did was lead sheep. That's what he did. Wandering in the desert, going from watering hole to watering hole. And the Bible said that he did that for 40 years. So what in the world could that possibly be? Seems like a waste of time. What in the world could that possibly qualify Moses to do? And here's what God's going to say. I want you to lead my people because they're going to walk around in the desert too, just like those sheep did and wait for it for 40 years. And you're going to lead them. And I want you to notice that what Moses had been, uh, he had been perfectly prepared for this assignment from God. What to him seemed like a waste of time and what disqualified him. He doesn't have any experience to lead all these people. But God says, yes, you do. Because you already have experience. You thought it was a waste of time, but you led sheep all the way through the desert from watering hole to watering hole for 40 years. It's the very... It's like God was saying the very season that you thought was wasted and worthless. I'm going to use that. You thought it disqualified you, but I'm going to show you that it's prepared you perfectly for what I'm calling you to step into. So write this down. This might be helpful. I'm going to use what you went through to make your purpose happen. And listen, this isn't just for Moses. If you hadn't already inserted yourself here, say, man, does that apply to me, God? Yes. Yes, we go through things, man, and we, we... we, it's decisions we made that were poor, sometimes it's things that happen to us. Every step that you took wasn't God's will, but here's what he does. He uses that, right? Maybe like, like Moses, he murdered somebody. He hung with the wrong people. Maybe uh, he was into some wrong stuff, but God can re- redeem that because he reveals our purpose in that. So we have to change our perspective. We have to have a change of heart, a change of how we view and look at things how God views them. Moses, you know, you've, you've been wasting time, but I'm going to use all of that to help you do what I called you to do. You're right where you need to be. You're exactly where you need to be. And f- need to be. So for some of you, man, you need to hear that. Some of you have been wasting time. 
You stepped away. Maybe you stiff-armed God. Maybe you ignored God's calling on your life. And you experience all the numbness that comes with that and that distance between you and God. You don't feel connected with him. It's hard for you to worship. But it's an important time in, this, in your life to be connected to God. And God says, I can use all that. I know you've made me waste the time. I know you have insecurity about it, but I can use that. God says, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. So unfortunately for Moses, his insecurity just kind of overrode God's promise there. It just was, seemed to be too much for him. In chapter 3 and 4, there's a conversation between Moses and God. You can go back and, and read this. And, 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 and Moses responds to this God's big promise that he made. You know, I'm God. Don't worry about anything. I'm with you. And this is his response. Moses answered. This is his response. What if, everybody say what if. That'll come back. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, this is God's response to his what if. Is what is, everybody say what is. What is that in your hand? He said a staff. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. So here's the second point here is insecurity happens when we focus on what if instead of what is. That's when insecurity happens. I'll say it again. Happens when, when we focus on what if instead of what is. Insecurity starts to, to happen. And most response to God was, what if they don't listen to me, God? What if they don't listen to what you say and what I say? And God's response is, well, his response is, what's in your hand? You may already know this. I don't know. But do you know that hesitation is a symptom of fear? It's a symptom of fear. And I'm like, dang, Moses. What more can God do? He's talking, he's talking to you out of a burning bush. He's talking to you. It's burning up, but it's burning, but not burning up. It's a mirror. You're literally looking at a miracle. But Moses said, yeah, but what if they don't listen? And how many times have we forfeited God's plan for our life because we've conjured up what ifs in our life? And half the time they're not even real, but we're afraid and we're fearful, looking at every possible scenario. And Yeah, I should get out of that relationship, God. I, should, I know you're calling me to start a business, but what if? And here's the deal. If we're going to do what God's called us to do and become who he's called us to be, here's what I've noticed. People who worry about what if almost never do what God's called them to do. Not fully. People are constantly worried about what are people thinking about me? Do they like me? I just saw a study that was Posted on Facebook that says the more time you spend on Facebook, the less happy you are. I don't know if it's a scientific study, but the whole time, the reason is we're comparing ourselves to other people. And we don't let ourselves measure up and we get consumed about what will they think. So what God does, he starts focusing on something and he said, you know, what is? What is in your hand, Moses? What is it? And Moses said, it's a stick, God. So not only am I not good enough, I don't have enough. I can't go to Pharaoh with just a stick. I don't have enough money to go to Pharaoh. All I have is a stick. And the stick was very symbolic. Have you ever seen a, a shepherd's staff? Should be a picture on the screen. It's very symbolic, especially for Moses here. It's his identity. That would tell the story of his work. It's something he spent doing 40 years of his life. It's very symbolic. It was basically his life in his hand. And he was devaluing that. This, all I've got is this stupid stick. What have you got in your hand? And basically, Moses, it's my life. And all of us have a stick. This is who I am. This is all I've done. This is my job. This is my education. It's all I've got. God says, listen, throw it down. Everybody say, throw it down. He throws it down. This process, for, these, this process of miracles start to to unfold here and, and he throws throws it down and God says okay it turns to a snake and he said pick it up and this is what's crazy to me about this and he says okay to picking a stick up right he's not worried about that but he's not fearful about that but he's fearful about stepping into what God's called him to do isn't that backwards 
It's crazy. So he went to another miracle. He said, well, Moses, he said, uh, he said, take your hand and put it in your shirt. Put it all the way in and pull it out. And it, it, the Bible says it has leprosy all over, all over his skin. He says, now, put it back in your shirt and pull it out. And it was clean as a whistle. So he shows them, he shows, he's demonstrating to Moses, I'm in control. When you go talk to him, you've got more than what you see. And then he says, hey, what, 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 what else you got? He said, he said well, I got, a, I got a cup of water. He said, okay, but pour it out. He, he, put, he had some water and he poured it out and it turned into blood. So he gave, gave him more, trying to encourage him even more that, hey, man, I can do anything. And God says, have I proven my point yet, Moses? Do you get the picture here? Write this down. Whatever you have is all that you need to do what God's called you to do. We can get caught up, and I know I can watch you. I know God's called me hear the same thing that you hear a lot of times. And I know God's called you to something specific. And it's really hard to watch people at best drag their feet towards it, but to walk away from it, to put it on pause, to allow themselves to be distracted by other things. Because this insecurity creeps in and it starts, you start focusing on what you don't have. And I'm telling you from experience and mostly from scripture is that you have, when God calls you something, at that point, you've got all you need at that point. So whatever you have is all that you need to do what God's called you to do. But here's Moses, I don't have enough. And here's us. I don't have enough education. I'm not connected to the right people. Instead of looking at what's in my hand, I start looking at what everybody else is doing and what everybody else has. And he says, all I have is this stick. They've got way more stuff than me. They're way smarter than me. They've got a better job than me. They've got more income than me. And we start focusing on it. We just stack it on top of it, each other. And Moses says, all I've got is this stinking stick. So write this down. Insecurity sets in when we don't value what God has already given us. And you've been blessed. We've all been blessed. And man, when he calls you something, you've got what you need in that moment for it. And he wants to use to change the world to, to help people get out of bondage, not unlike Moses. That's what we're doing here. I could get real obsessed if I wanted to about, hey man, the church down the roads has a lot more uh, money than we've got. God doesn't call us to look at that. He says, I got, Richard, I've got exactly what you need to do for the assignment that you have where you are, you and the people that call Revolution Church home. And it's the same assignment that Moses has to, is to help people get free, get, let the, lead them out of bondage. That's our assignment. It's unique in different ways. God goes about doing it, but collectively, that's what we're called to do. It's to lead people out of bondage. So we've got to stop focusing on the what ifs and start looking at what is in your hand. What's God already put inside of you? It's unique. And everybody's got something. But you've got everything you need to do what God's called you to do. Okay? So sometimes we don't want to hear that because then if we don't want to hear it, we're not really responsible for it. All right? Well, God's saying, man, you got a stick? I can use a stick. you got a hand? I can use a hand. Oh, water. I'm good at using water. I can use some water. And all of a sudden, we become responsible to trust God with what we have. And all of that went down. All that was him trying to convince and talk Moses into, I've got you. It's all about me, not you. And you thought at that point, Moses would have been on board. Like, okay, God, let's do it. Let's do it. You've talked me into it. But still, Moses is riddled with insecurity. And he's still focused on his own weakness instead of God's power at this point. Now, we're going to finish in uh, Exodus 4.10. And this is one of the saddest conversations in the Bible. It really is. It kind of breaks your heart to read it because it sounds like some of us. Now, God had just performed all these miracles. And in verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I'm so sorry. I have never been eloquent. I know you called me to go talk to Pharaoh. Negotiate with Pharaoh. But I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since I've spoken to you, your servant. Like even though, God, you called me to it, you didn't all of a sudden switch my tongue out and make it where I can, I'm eloquent. So I'm, you haven't done that miracle. I am still slow of speech and tongue. 
And you can feel the pain and the angst that he has as he's saying this to God. Like, I know, like a lot of us, I know God's calling me this, but I just, I'm insecure. In Exodus uh, 4.11, it says, The Lord said to him, really, really, really said this clearly to him. He said, Moses, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf and mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you exactly what to say. So God starts with me, and you know what? Do you not think I've noticed you've been stuttering throughout our whole conversation? Who do you think made you? Who do you think gave you your voice? But then he follows up with this. He says, go anyway. I hear you. But go anyway. There's no more excuses, Moses. I'm going to help you. I will personally teach and talk and show you what to say. And get this. This is heartbreaking in verse 13. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. So here's the next one. Insecurity happens when we focus on our flaws instead of God's favor. It's part of our focus we let insecurity in. We start, when we make it about us and we look at what all's wrong with us instead of the favor that God offers and promises. And he's promising, he said, I've got you. I know a thing or two about talking. Jesus talked to dead people and they got up. Jesus talked to storms and they became still. And God spoke the world into existence. So God's saying, I know a thing or two about powerful communication. I've got this. I know you've got some issues, but I'm going to be your teacher. And Moses says, I can't do it. Please, God, send somebody else. I know it's a worthwhile cause. I know people need to be freed. I know there's hungry people that need to be fed. I know there's the, the world needs hope. I, I know there's brokenness in our city and our community. And I do think they should get it, God. I do believe that. I want them to have it. But please use somebody else. So he told God no in this moment. Verse 14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Now I can't blame him. I mean, seriously. I mean, I don't know why God continues to give him opportunity. Oh, y'all better be glad I'm not God. You know what I'm saying? He seems like a coward, a sellout, a cop out. Are you serious? God's going to do all this stuff right in front of you. He's making you all these promises. Are you still going to say no? Because he thought he wasn't good enough. And God got angry. So that insecurity got a hold of Moses. But God has this obvious pattern of using our weakness and our uniqueness to change lives. But when we devalue who he created us to be. And when we focus on our flaws instead of his favor, it breaks the heart of God. It angers God. I feel like God was saying, man, if I wanted you to be eloquent, I would have made you eloquent. But I wanted a stutterer to walk up to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Because if you were the best negotiator in the world and you had perfect speech, Moses, you would have got the credit and not me. I could have hired the best lawyer to go and negotiate that. But when a stutterer walks in who's been working as a shepherd for 40 years on the backside of the desert, who can't even talk right, comes in and says, let my people go. And it happens. Everybody will know that that is from God. There will be no doubt. And God's saying, I want to use your weakness. I want to use your flaw. That thing that makes you unattractive and unusable is the very thing that makes me want to choose you. And man, what a message to Moses, but what a message to us. I don't know why the conversation continued. The Lord got angry, but he didn't give up on Moses. And I want to share one more thing with you, then I'm done. It's a long story, and it's got an ending to it. And I'm going to let you read it. We'll cover it in the spring. We'll do a, a thing on Moses and Pharaoh and Egypt and all those things. But I wanted to read something to you that sounded just like an obituary. 
What became of Moses? Did he ever say yes? And we know that God never gave up on him. So in Deuteronomy chapter 34, because Moses died in chapter 34, here's what it says. Here's what we find out. Here's his obituary. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. He must have said yes. Whom the Lord knew face to face. That, 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 that's his obituary saying he knew the Lord intimately. And he, was, he did great things for the Lord. Who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent to him to do in Egypt. He did God's work. To Pharaoh and all his officials in the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Man, you and I can only hope that, man, that, that when people read our obituary, and they will, and they will, that it reads half as good as that. He was an insecure man who God should have given up on, in my opinion. I'm, I'd have been, I'm done with you, man. I can't convince you. you know, I'm, I, I don't do this burning bush thing for everybody. Why am I having to talk you into this? But the good news of the gospel is this. God doesn't give up on us. He doesn't give up, even when other people do. And when people write you off, walk away, God doesn't give up on us. Some of you think that your faithlessness and fear has disqualified you, and it hasn't. Yes, you said no. Yes, you've been wondering. Yes, you show up. Maybe you've been numb. Not doing the, the, the small things, the big things, or anything that God's called you to. And you think that's disqualified you, but God hasn't given up on you. And he's completely committed to his plan for your life. So what would it look like, man, if we cast off insecurity, cast off fear, stop worrying about what everybody thinks? You know, we looked at God's favor instead of our flaws. It's that, that's our default. What if we stop worrying about what people think or say and we're more worried about what God called us to do? God's got great plans for your life and the, and the life of this church and what's happening here. And I, I just can't wait for some of you, man, the light bulbs are going off in your head today even. And what God calls to do is to have a change of heart. That's what this series is about, is to change the direction of your thinking. Rethink your situation. He is so good. All I got from that was God is so good. And he's so intent on the plan for your life and for my life. And he doesn't give up on us. Man, what a great thing to walk away with, man, that we can have confidence and some of you are going to do great things, man. This is just a, a launch pad for what you're going to do for the Lord. And it will start right here from a decision you made, right here in this building. I can say, I know them. I know they're, they're doing great things. I actually know them. They used to come to my church. This is where they got started. I love that. It's my favorite thing in the world. But listen, it starts with first acknowledging who God is. Who God is. I mean, he thought so much of each one of us. He sent Jesus to earth to live a perfect life so that he would be the perfect sacrifice because the, the sin debt is so great for all of us that we could never repay it. And Jesus willingly, willingly gave his life on the cross and his blood, that's symbolic of covering our sin, it paid for it. So we wouldn't have to. Because the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from God. But what Jesus did when we received that, we surrender our lives to him and we repent. Man, that's a, that's a great thing. Repentance, I want to change that stigma of that word. Repent is an awesome thing. We got a chance to repent today. God, I've been going this direction, but I'm going to go your direction. And we repent, walk away. And usually when we repent, we're walking away from something, we're walking towards God. And then we have the opportunity to do that today. So would you stand with me? Before we leave, man, I'm, I'm hoping that you're leaving with confidence right now. That you are 
I'm going to make some moves, man. It's not spiritual laziness, Rich. It wasn't lazy. It was insecurity the whole time. And God's been so patient with me. But what I've read today and what I've heard today is that God hasn't given up on me. I'm going to step into that. And the good news is he uses other people to help you with that. That's why we gather as a church like this. To get encouraged and inspired and challenged and changed. That's why we have life groups happen during the week. You're going to find out, man, if I'm really doing what God's called me to do, I've got to surround myself with God's people. Because they're struggling too. They need you and you need them. And the common goal that brings us together is we're trying to serve God. Man, he's given us a great assignment. This building, this campus, this area. It's awesome. I can't believe how well God set this up for us. But he wants to use you and me. And he knows the insecurities in a way. So could you repent of your insecurity? Just ask God to remove it. What a great opportunity today.